Well, I've already filed the marriage certificate with Abby. So, no matter how much you beg and cry, our divorce is final. I'm officially married with her. You kept me waiting a long time because you wouldn't agree to divorce. Abby glared at me with a displeased expression, probably thinking about all the time she was made to wait. Since I'm kind, I tried to figure out how to leave you without hurting you too much, but when you collapsed, it gave me the perfect excuse. Dan is really kind, but because of that I had to wait for so long, and it made me so mad. The two of them bombarded me with their selfish excuses. Divorce from a useless person who can't do housework or work. I'll also demand alimony. I had a lot I wanted to say, but I realized it was useless to argue with people who would shamelessly say such absurd things. I decided to accept the divorce. Okay. But then, seven days later, Dan called me in tears. My name is Kate Jones. I'm 27 years old. I work at a branch of a real estate company. I got married two years ago and currently live with my husband, Dan, but before that I lived with my mom. My parents divorced when I was young and my mom raised me on her own. However, my dad paid child support properly and my mom was independent, so we never had financial difficulties. Both sets of grandparents doted on me. They celebrated events like my birthday as well as my school entrance and graduation, so I can confidently say that I grew up with plenty of love. Now, my mom lives about a 10-minute walk from my house, and we sometimes have lunch or tea together whenever I can find time for my busy job. I also keep in relatively frequent contact with my grandparents. The person I see the least is my dad, but it's not because he neglects me. It's more that he seems to be considerate of my mom's feelings. We stay in touch, and it almost feels like he's a father on a long-term assignment. I can say that I grew up without lacking anything, but deep down, there was always an awareness that I was a child of a divorced family, and I longed for a home where both parents were together. That's probably why I was so determined not to get divorced myself. As a result, I ended up in a difficult marriage. I met Dan when he came to the branch where I worked to find a new place to live, and I was assigned to help him. He mentioned that his lease on the place he had lived in since his school days was expiring. It's a room like a dorm with a shared bathroom. My salary has gone up a bit, so I want to move to a slightly better place. With that request, I introduced him to quite a few properties, and during our conversations while traveling between them, we discovered that we shared many interests and grew closer. Well, would it be okay if we exchanged contacts? It's generally not recommended to exchange personal contact information with customers, but I also wanted to talk more, so I ended up giving him my personal account. As a result, we started dating, and eventually, the conversation turned to marriage. The current place that you helped me find, Kate, is coming up for lease renewal soon. So, I was thinking, maybe we could look for a place where we can live together. Would you help me find one again? That was Dan's way of proposing to me. We had a small, intimate wedding with just close family. I don't have many relatives, and Dan's parents aren't very close with theirs, so we decided to keep it simple. The guests were my mom, Dan's parents, my maternal grandparents, and Dan's grandparents. After exchanging vows at the chapel, we had a small reception at a restaurant we rented out. But I was filled with happiness. When I went to tell my dad and paternal grandparents about the wedding, they congratulated me and celebrated with us. He didn't attend the wedding out of consideration for my mom. It was never about neglecting me. My dad and I maintain a good relationship with that amount of distance. And so, 
our married life began. We moved into a newly built two-bedroom apartment. Of course, it was a property listed with the company I work for, and I searched for it with great enthusiasm. It's not very big, but it's spacious enough for a newlywed couple to start their life together. The location was convenient for both of our workplaces, and I think I found us a pretty good place. As expected of a pro, finding such a nice place. The first apartment you found me was great too, but Kate, you really have a knack for real estate. Dan said, expressing his satisfaction with the apartment. I felt a sense of fulfillment both in my work and my personal life. Our newlywed life started out happy like that. We had agreed to share the housework, but because Dan often came home late due to his jobs and sales, and I usually got home on time, the housework mostly fell to me. When he did come home late at night, Dan was usually drunk. I can't help it. I have to drink for business. I'm not that strong, so it's tough. I understand, but please don't overdo it. I know. I'm sorry for making you worry. Dan would say this and then pull me into a tight embrace. It was a typical newlywed moment. But after about six months, his behavior started to change. Even though we were only six months into our marriage, still very much newlyweds, it was as if the honeymoon phase had ended, and his attitude towards me took a sudden turn. He began to belittle my work. You're home already? Working at a real estate office must be easy. Do you even have to work overtime? Our office has evening hours for clients who can only come at night, so there's rarely any overtime after the day shift. Well, sounds pretty easy. Why don't you work nights too? It's not like your jobs is hard, so adding a little more time shouldn't be a big deal. I can't be the only one bringing in money. Let me be clear, both of us are working. We both contribute to the household finances. So there's no truth to the idea that I'm relying solely on Dan's income. How many hours did you work today? You just sit there at the office, and when someone shows up, you do a little bit of work, and you still get paid. Real estate must be a really cushy job. But Dan's comments only got worse from there. It's not like that. I keep in touch with clients talk to landlords, handle repair requests from tenants, and there's plenty more to do. Enough already. No matter what you say, it's still a passive job. You're not out there trying to do anything new or different, are you? Dan continued to make belittling remarks about my jobs. Why are you saying such awful things? You weren't like this before. Huh, awful? Am I really saying anything awful? I'm just stating the facts. Dan glared at me as he continued. The real mistake is expecting me to do housework when our jobs are so different. So that's it, I thought to myself. Dan probably felt guilty about leaving all the housework to me, and that guilt had turned into this attitude. I'm sorry, Kate. It's just that we're in a busy season right now, and I can't help but put more on you. At first, he apologized with a guilty look, but now he acts like it's only natural for me to handle everything, even tossing his dirty laundry all over the floor. Could you at least put them in the laundry basket? You're so annoying. If you see it on the floor, just pick them up and put them in the basket yourself. You could do that in the time it takes you to complain to me. He was completely unreasonable. It was frustrating, but since Dan was indeed busy with work and I had more free time, I silently took on the housework. I believed that once things calmed down at work, Dan would go back to being the person I loved before we got married. But there was no sign of him returning to the Dan I had loved. The more I quietly handled the housework, 
the more arrogant Dan became. You're not doing much work anyway, right? So why don't you keep the house a bit cleaner? Even though I had more free time than Dan, I was still working. There were some places I just couldn't get to. The apartment we moved into after getting married was new, and I tried to keep it as clean as possible. But Dan would nitpick and find the smallest imperfections, accusing me of slacking off. If you're so bad at keeping the house in order, maybe you should just quit your job altogether. Now he started saying things like that. To be honest, relying solely on Dan's income would make it difficult to continue living comfortably in our current apartment. When I explained this to him with the numbers, Dan exploded in anger. So you finally said what you really think. You think my salary is low, and you've been looking down on me because of it, haven't you? I had no idea what he was talking about. Wait, I've never thought that even once. Don't lie. After we got married and learned each other's salaries, you started telling me to do housework. You only did that because you thought my salary was low. I had been mistaken. I thought Dan felt guilty for being too busy to do housework and that this guilt was causing him to act out. But the truth was different. After we got married, I learned that my salary was higher than Dan's. This fact hurt Dan's pride and he started to feel like he was being made to do housework because he was earning less. Yeah, my salary is low. It must have felt great to know you make more money than me. But our salaries aren't that different, I think. The hours we work are different, though. Oh, so that's what it was. I realized that Dan wasn't just upset about the total salary, but also felt like he was losing out on the hourly wage as well. That's why he kept attacking the fact that I rarely had to work overtime. I've never thought that way, Dan. I've never looked down on you. But if I made you feel that way, I'm sorry. I hadn't realized it, but maybe I had hurt Dan without knowing it. I apologized to him. As long as you understand. Listen, in a marriage, the husband is supposed to be the superior one. If you can understand that, then you need to take better care of the house. It felt unreasonable, but I was relieved that my words seemed to calm Dan down a bit. Because my parents divorced, I was determined not to go through the same thing myself. I didn't want to do anything that would cause a rift between Dan and me. I had told Dan this, so I believed he understood how I felt. I thought that if I could just endure a little, everything would be fine. If we both kept clashing, we would only hurt each other, and our relationship would suffer. So if I made a small concession, we could avoid conflict and live peacefully together. I believed that this would bring back a calm life, and Dan would return to being the kind person he was before we got married. But that was a naive thought. Thinking he had made me submit, Dan became even more arrogant, acting like a king and treating me like a servant. Listen, all you need to do is follow my orders. Don't even think about having your own opinions. Yes, I understand. If you're someone without the motivation to do things on your own, just quietly listen to the person who does. And from now on, always speak to me with respect. Before I knew it, I could no longer argue with Dan. I once heard that if you suddenly plunge a bird into hot water, it will panic and try to escape. But if you place it in water and gradually raise the temperature, it won't realize the danger until it's too late, and eventually it will be boiled and eaten. I was like that bird. Had I unknowingly pushed myself too far? One day I suddenly collapsed at work and was taken to the hospital by ambulance, where I ended up being admitted. Two weeks after I was hospitalized, Dan came to visit. The moment he entered the room, he sneered and said, 
You're really useless, you know that? Standing beside him was a woman I had never seen before. I'm sorry I've caused so much trouble. I'll do my best to get home as soon as possible, so please forgive me. Nah, there's no need to push yourself. Just take all the time you need to recover. Really? Is that okay? I was surprised by his unexpected words. Because I had expected Dan to blame me. Yeah, it's fine. Because we won't have anything to do with each other anymore. What do you mean? You're really slow, aren't you? I'm saying that I'm divorcing you and marrying Abby here. Dan pulled the woman he called Abby closer, and she leaned into him with a pleased expression. Abby was a woman with heavy makeup, clearly much older than Dan. Actually, we've already split up. I haven't signed any divorce papers. Not only are you useless, but now you're sick too. You have no value left. So I went ahead and filed our divorce papers. So he forged my signature and submitted them? That won't hold up. Oh, but it did. Dan and the woman exchanged smug grins, laughing together. Who is this woman? Oh, my new wife. Nice to meet you. I'm Abby, Dan's wife. Abby said triumphantly. Well, I've already filed the marriage certificate with Abby. So no matter how much you beg and cry, our divorce is final. I'm officially married with Abby. You kept me waiting a long time because you wouldn't agree to divorce. Abby glared at me with a displeased expression, probably thinking about all the time she was made to wait. How long were you saying you were kept waiting? Days. It wasn't just days. It was a whole year. So they had been together like this for a year. A year is incredibly precious for a woman in her 30s. You wouldn't understand that. How old are you? I might look young, but I'm 38. Abby said with a proud smile, her heavy makeup cracking. She looked her age, but saying that would just cause more trouble, so I kept quiet. Since I'm kind, I tried to figure out how to leave you without hurting you too much, but when you collapsed, it gave me the perfect excuse. Dan is really kind, but because of that, I had to wait for so long, and it made me so mad. The two of them bombarded me with their selfish excuses. Divorce from a useless person who can't do housework or work. I'll also demand alimony. I had a lot I wanted to say, but I realized it was useless to argue with people who would shamelessly say such absurd things. I decided to accept the divorce. Okay. When I said so, they left looking satisfied. It was like a storm. I muttered to myself, pulling out my phone from under the covers. I had recorded the entire conversation. I could use this to expose Dan's wrongdoings. When I was admitted to the hospital, I was apparently in a very dangerous state in more ways than one. It seemed that as I kept obeying Dan, I lost the ability to think for myself. I constantly watched his moods, did everything I could to keep him from getting upset, manage the housework to his satisfaction, and continue to work to keep our lives going. The collapse was due to overwork. I hadn't been eating properly, hadn't been resting, and had been pushing myself solely to please Dan. As a result, I suddenly collapsed. I remember a colleague at work mentioning that I seemed to have lost some weight, and I think I replied that I was on a diet. I only said that reflexively because my colleague looked concerned. If Dan found out that someone was worried about me, he'd be displeased. That's why I said what I did. What started as small concessions gradually led to me giving up more and more ground until I found myself at the edge of a cliff, 
trapped with no way out. The worst part was that I had no awareness of it at all. I was really shocked. I thought you were living happily. My mom said tearfully when she rushed to the hospital. I still don't understand why I collapsed. That was the truth. All I wanted was to live happily with Dan. And I thought I was just making a few small sacrifices to achieve that. So how did things end up like this? So has Dan come to visit you? He was always so kind. How could he not say anything after hearing you collapsed? What happened? I wanted to ask the same question. It wasn't easy to explain everything that had happened to my mom in just a few words. For now, just focus on resting. We'll figure out what to do next later. I ended up staying in the hospital for a while. Maybe it was because I could finally rest, both physically and mentally, but the fog in my mind began to clear. Why did I keep listening to Dan like that? Gradually, I started to think for myself again, and I began to realize that it would be difficult to continue my marriage with Dan. That's when Dan showed up at the hospital with Abby. Dan probably thought he still had me under his control, but by that time, I had fully awakened. However, I decided to pretend I was still under his thumb to see how things would play out. I quietly turned on the recording function on my phone under the covers. Now, my phone held proof that Dan had forged the divorce papers. If I remember correctly, that's a crime. After some research, I found out that it's called forgery of a private document, and it carries a prison sentence of at least three months and up to five years. Usually, crimes come with both a prison sentence and a fine, but this one had no fine. This means that unless he gets probation, Dan will go to prison. For some reason, a crime that only carries a prison sentence feels pretty serious. Dan did something that's serious to me. There's no need to hold back against such a villain. I called a certain person from my phone in my hand. Five days after Dan's visit, I was discharged from the hospital, but I didn't return to the house I had shared with him. I had lived in that house for two years. The first six months were happy, but then Dan gradually changed, and by the time a year had passed, he had become a tyrant. It was probably around the time he met Abby. What I still don't understand is why. If Dan wanted to divorce me and marry Abby, he needed to control me in the first place. What was his goal in doing all that? But now there's something more important to focus on than figuring that out. Now that I've regained my physical and mental health, I've decided to get my revenge. Two days after I was discharged, which was seven days after Dan and Abby came to the hospital, as I expected, Dan called me. Kate, I'm so glad you answered. Where are you? Why haven't you come home? How could he be so shameless? I was too stunned to speak. And who might this be? Come on, don't joke around. It's me, your husband, Dan. I don't have a husband. If Dan had filed for divorce and married Abby, he was now her husband. He is no longer my husband. You divorced me and remarried Abby, right? So you're her husband now, and you have nothing to do with me. That's okay. I'll divorce Abby and remarry you, so there's nothing to worry about. No one was worried about that. I was just stating the facts. I'm not worried at all because I have no intention of remarrying you. Please be happy with Abby. You're misunderstanding. The only one I love is you. Please understand. Dan began crying over the phone, likely thinking that his tears would move my heart. I was being blackmailed. Abby is the daughter of my company's president. She threatened to fire me if I didn't date her. I was forced into it, believe me. 
Dan continued to cry and plead. Did Abby also order you to forge the divorce papers? Yes. She said that if I didn't do it, she'd make your life miserable. I had no choice. I'm planning to press charges against you for forgery. When I mentioned pressing charges, Dan stopped crying and fell silent. Oh, by the way, the lease on that house is up for renewal soon. I won't be renewing it. It's convenient that everything, house, marriage, and love, it can be switched out without any waste. Wait, I love you. Please, just listen to me. Unfortunately, our company won't be able to assist you in finding a new home. Please use another agency. Goodbye. I ignored Dan's desperate pleas, hung up the phone, and blocked his number. Dan must have panicked and reached out to me because he had just learned the truth. That morning, he probably saw a newspaper article or a TV news segment about my parents. The news that my parents had remarried as the Jones home president and wife remarry had gone public. My parents, who had divorced when I was young, had gotten back together. Dan must have seen the photo of me in the article and realized that I was the daughter of the president of Jones Home. My dad, more precisely his ancestors, were large landowners who used their real estate holdings to start Jones Home. Even now, our company owns houses and buildings across the country, and Jones Home manages them. I work at one of our branch offices. My parents didn't divorce out of hatred for each other. My mom had a talent for crafting and started a brand that became popular, leading her to start her own business. This displeased my paternal grandmother, who was also my mom's mother-in-law. Jones Home was my grandmother's company, and my grandfather had joined the family through their marriage. My grandparents worked together to build the company. My grandmother wanted my mom to help grow the business alongside my dad. So, as my mom's brand grew, it was only natural that the relationship between my mom and grandmother would deteriorate. After various events, my parents decided to separate. Marriage is usually a matter between two people, but Jones Home is too large of a company for that, and my mom was deeply committed to her brand. They decided that further family conflict could affect the company's management, so they separated. My mom left with me, and my grandmother accepted it. Perhaps my grandmother hoped my dad would remarry and have another child to inherit the company. But despite her encouragement, my dad never remarried. My mom didn't remarry either. Even after they separated, they continued to care for each other. That's why my mom kept the Jones name, even after the divorce, and before I married Dan, my last name was Jones too. Now, after being unknowingly divorced, I've gone back to being Jones. While my grandmother and mom had a strained relationship, my grandmother respected my mom's character and skills and treated me kindly as her grandchild. My grandmother was a fair and broad-minded person, but she couldn't fully accept my mom, who had started her own business, considering the family heritage and the company. She wanted the whole family to work together to protect Joan's home. At my dad's request, he asked me to work with them if I didn't mind, so I joined the company under the condition that I would only be a regular employee. Very few people knew that I was the president's daughter. My grandmother knew but never brought it up. She was always careful to separate personal matters from business, but my dad secretly told me that she was pleased that I was trying to learn about the real estate business. My grandmother had reflected on the situation, realizing that the troubles I had experienced, including my parents' divorce, were related. And so, my mom was asked to come back, with my grandmother bowing her head in apology for being so stubborn all these years. That's how my parents ended up remarrying after 25 years. 
There was no way the media would stay silent on such an interesting story. When my mom visited me in the hospital and told me about it, I called my grandmother and said I wanted to join them for the interviews. Of course, my grandmother was delighted to have me participate. Major newspapers, TV stations, and magazines all came to cover the story, and I was prominently featured. I did this knowing that Dan would definitely see it. As expected, Dan found out that I was the daughter of the president of Jones Home, a company with large land holdings. He called me in a panic, crying, realizing the magnitude of the opportunity he had lost. I pressed charges against Dan for forging the divorce papers. Dan's lawyer sought a settlement, but I refused it, and as a result, Dan was prosecuted and found guilty with a suspended sentence. Of course, I also sued Abby for alimony since she was aware of the forgery. And she was also found guilty, albeit with a lighter sentence than Dan's, also suspended. Dan and Abby had met at a company party. Abby had fallen in love with Dan at first sight, despite knowing he was married, and pressured him into marriage. At first, Dan was troubled by Abby's advances, as she was 10 years older and not his type. But he couldn't refuse because she was the boss's daughter, and eventually they became deeply involved. The company president, Abby's father, was frustrated that Abby couldn't find a husband and turned a blind eye to the situation. He probably thought that if Dan took his daughter a little money to Dan's wife would solve any problems. Dan later confessed that his initial attitude toward me was due to his guilt over making me do most of the housework while earning less. By criticizing you, Kate, I wanted to convince myself that I was in the right. I was happy to be pampered by you. I was just being immature, and I regret it now. He said that and cried. But even if that was his true feeling, the fact remains that he deeply hurt me, pushing me to the brink of losing my sanity. Initially, it might have been out of a desire to be pampered, but as Abby came into the picture, he likely began to see my illness as an opportunity to divorce me. That's why, when he heard I was sick, he hurriedly submitted the forged divorce papers and registered his marriage with Abby. He thought that if he created a fake accompli, I, being as compliant as a doll, would accept it without protest. If his affair with Abby was exposed, he would be the one at fault in the divorce. He wanted to make sure I was the one to blame before proceeding with the divorce. So he treated me like a servant at home, trying to provoke me into being the one at fault while telling Abby that I refused to divorce him stalling for time and waiting for the right moment. I never intended to leave you, Kate, but Abby was so persistent, I couldn't refuse. The only one I truly love is you. I was just waiting for Abby to give up. Dan desperately told his lawyer, but of course, it fell on deaf ears. Abby's father was furious and forced Dan and Abby to divorce. Dan was then fired for misconduct, and now he's working at a job where he lives on site, working from early morning until late at night to pay off the alimony he owes me. Abby's father didn't pursue alimony from Dan. He prioritized my compensation, considering Abby's involvement as a co-conspirator. Honestly, I didn't care about the money, but I was determined to make sure they paid for their sins. That's why, no matter how much Abby's father pleaded, I refused to settle. He eventually knelt before me, asking to resolve the matter quietly, promising that Abby would never have such freedom again. When he saw how resolute I was, he finally understood. Now, Abby is reportedly under strict family supervision, being reformed from the ground up. Looking back, Part of me feels that if Abby had never fallen for Dan, none of this would have happened. 
But then again, considering she relentlessly pursued a married man, her guilt is not light. Dan, too, should have been more conscious of his marriage and refused Abby's advances. But he didn't. He dreamed of marrying the boss's daughter and betraying his wife for that future, a crime I cannot forgive. What happens to the two of them from now on is no longer my concern. As long as they never appear before me again, that's enough. With my parents remarried, I've started studying to take over as the president's daughter and heir. Although I've learned quite a bit about real estate as an employee, managing a company is entirely different. From now on, I'll need to study much more about business management. And because I was so stubborn about not wanting to divorce like my parents did, insisting on staying with one person for life, I ended up in such a situation. It was due to my own weakness. If I had been more assertive, if I had faced Dan properly, maybe things wouldn't have ended up this way. Maybe we would still be a happy couple. Sometimes, thinking about that makes my chest tighten because I really did love him. I married him out of true love. And yet, I turned someone I loved into a criminal. There are times when I feel as if I, too, bear a heavy guilt for that fact. But when I expressed this to my mom and grandmother, they both told me I was wrong. Don't blame yourself. You didn't hurt anyone. That's very important. They committed their crimes because they chose to. Your mom is right. If there is any fault, it lies with me for not accepting your mom, for making you fearful. Now that my mom and grandmother have reconciled and grown close again, they comforted me in this way. I realized that blaming myself was also blaming them. People make mistakes. But what matters is how you respond when you do. That's what I've learned. I don't know if I'll ever meet someone I can love as deeply as I love Dan. But when that time comes, I will make sure never to repeat the same mistakes. A life where I refuse to love anyone again because of one failure would be a lonely one. But even if I don't meet someone like that again, I want to live a life where I can hold my head high and walk straight, even if I'm alone. Right now, I've just taken the first step on that path. I vowed to myself once again that I will lead a happy life. 